If monasticism was one of the pillars of the medieval church, then the other pillar is clearly the papacy. The emergence of bishops as a distinct function within Christianity came as a result of the institutionalizing of the early church in its search for unity and identity. The Bishop of Rome eventually emerged as the first among equals, and by the late 6th century, the office of the Roman Bishop had taken on a distinctive presence in the Christian world. Doctrine in defense of Roman primacy appealed to the saying of Jesus when he gave his disciple Simon Peter Barjona the keys of the kingdom. You are Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my church. In Greek, the same word, in different forms, is used. The Catholic tradition understands the meaning to be that Peter himself was the rock upon which the church was built. Therefore, in the Roman Catholic tradition, Peter is regarded as the first pope. By contrast, Protestants understand the rock to be Peter's confession of Christ as the Son of God. As church history reveals, the fabric of the faith itself is tightly intertwined with the popes and the medieval see of Peter. In 1513, Giovanni de' Medici was elected Pope. He has been reported to have said on that occasion, the papacy is ours, let us enjoy it. Well, the papacy is the office and the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. Since Peter and Paul are reported to have died in Rome, suffered martyrdom there, this gave that city prominence, and throughout the history of Christianity, of course, Rome has had that significant prominence. Now that claim was challenged for centuries, Rome, of course, being the most important Christian cities, and some would argue the challenge goes on right up to today, particularly if you're part of the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Even as late as the 11th century, Pope Gregory VII was still insisting there's only one pope in the world. Well, whatever claims theoretically have been made for popes and the papacy, in practice they owed most of their authority to the fact that the pope was the guardian of the body of St. Peter, which allegedly had been discovered near the present day Vatican. This brought men to Rome, it brought influential people to Rome, and it caused them to listen to the voice of St. Peter, mediated through his personal representative on earth, the Pope, of course. The papacy is the central institution of Latin Christianity. In fact, popes figured one way or the other into practically every aspect of life in the Middle Ages. And together with monasticism, which we've previously considered, the papacy forms one of the two pillars upon which the Middle Ages is founded and on which the medieval church rests. Now Peter was the chief apostle of Jesus Christ. Tradition holds it that way. And if we go to the New Testament, we find that Peter is referred to by name far more than any of the other disciples of Jesus. Consider this. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Acts of the Apostles, in those five books, Peter is referred to by name more than 190 times. By contrast, the disciple next most often mentioned is the Apostle John, who's referred to by name a mere 29 times. So 190 times to Peter and 29 to John. Peter clearly is the chief apostle. You well know what Jesus said to him in Matthew 16. And I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Peter. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Peter receives the keys of the kingdom 
from Jesus Christ in Matthew 16. Now the idea of papal primacy, that is the significance of the popes, has two principal foundations. One is Peter as the chief apostle, and secondly the notion that bishops are the successors of Peter, successors of the apostles. And again, because Peter is thought to have suffered martyrdom in Rome, that makes Rome important. It makes the bishop of Rome Peter's direct successor. Now you begin to see how the foundations of papal theory come together. And of course we would do well to remember what Leo I said, the bishop of Rome in the fifth century, that there's a bunch of bishops, but one should be higher than all the rest. And of course he meant the bishop of Rome. Now the term bishop, we've already learned, comes from the Greek word episkopos, and it means overseer or superintendent. But the age-old question has to be this. Was Peter ever really in Rome? And if Peter was in Rome, what role did he play? What relation did Peter have to that early Christian community in Rome? Well, in early Christianity, we also have learned that important centers of the faith began to emerge early on principally associated with either apostles or their descendants. Places like Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Ephesus, Jerusalem, Thessaloniki, Philippi, Smyrna, Corinth, or Carthage in North Africa. And with these emerging centers of church power and authority came the concepts of religious or spiritual power authority and jurisdiction. And certain bishops came to perceive themselves as having greater power and more authority and a wider sphere of influence than, say, another bishop. It was Cyprian, church father in the third century, who coined the term the See of Peter, referring, of course, to Rome. And he's the first to speak and to use the term, the chair, of St. Peter. Now there is admittedly a problem we won't delve into in this lecture concerning the interpolation of texts in Cyprian and in others which have been used by the church in retrospect as it were to prove that there was a concept in the early church of papal power and authority. Well, be that as it may, which is certainly an issue of scholarly inquiry, by the fourth century the term Pope, which comes from the Latin Papa, had been used previously uh, by bishops in North Africa in places like Alexandria and in Carthage, but it came into regular use in the fourth century, this term Pope. And in the eleventh century, Gregory the Seventh whom we will meet in more detail a bit later, declared the title could only be used of the Bishop of Rome. Not just any bishop, but the Roman bishop. So the development and the power of the papacy then was a result of a long period of development. Now it's Leo I, a pope who, who ruled, and maybe I shouldn't use the term pope in the fifth century. He was the Bishop of Rome. He ruled from 440 to 461. Leo managed to get the emperor, the, whole, the, the Roman emperor, managed to get him, owing to some troubled political circumstances at the time, convinced the emperor to sign over to him, as bishop, a great deal of power and authority concerning the western churches, churches in the western part of the empire. It then became unlawful for bishops in places like Gaul, which is today France, to do anything without the consent of the bishop in Rome and the bishop's consent. Now when I say bishop and bishop's consent, you can read pope and papal consent, because that's what it's evolving into. Leo is the bishop who assumed the title Pontifex Maximus, which actually means supreme priest, and it was a title that Roman emperors used to have, but Leo takes it on himself. He also is the one to use in a widespread fashion the term 
plenitude of power, the fullness of power. And he began to regard himself as the bishop of the church in Rome as being representative of both religious and even civil power and authority. Now there were popes or bishops uh, in the early church, and again I'm speaking now about the fifth century, who claimed that whatever the bishops in Rome said was law. And whatever the bishop in Rome said applied not just to people in Roman churches, but Christians everywhere. And this can be traced back to the mid-fifth century. Now, you can see very easily how this concept, if people buy into it, if it takes root, gives a single man occupying a single office in a single city a great deal of power and authority. Now, it was in these times, you may be wondering, how was it that Leo managed to carry this off? Good question. At this time in history, Leo was able to assert himself in this power because there was significant social turmoil. And he made substantial gains for himself and for the office of Bishop of Rome during these times. For example, in the year 452, Leo met with one of the most famous personalities in all of history, a man by the name of Attila the Hun. Leo went out of Rome, he met with Attila, and he convinced Attila to withdraw his troops and not sack the city of Rome. Wow! If you can pull this off with a guy like Attila, you can then turn around and say, and my reward shall be that you will obey me. Had it not been for me, we'd have been sacked and pillaged. Okay, maybe that was a lucky one-off. Three years later, Leo goes out of Rome again and meets with the leader of the Vandal armies. Now the Vandals do sack Rome, but he was able to get concessions that the damage to property and people would be lessened. Okay, Leo placed great emphasis upon the Pope, and I have to start using that term now, as the heir of St. Peter. Hence, the adage, Peter has spoken through Leo. I'm the representative of Peter. Peter is the chief apostle. Peter was given his authority by Jesus Christ himself. And we have St. Matthew, who gives us that information. And on this basis, Rome could claim the primacy of teaching, because Peter had been bishop. Leo argued that Peter, in fact, had been given more authority than any of the other apostles or disciples. This meant that profound universal authority had been invested in the person of Peter, and therefore in his successors, of which Leo was one. Peter was therefore the vicar of Christ. Now that term, which we hear even to this day, simply means the representative of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ doesn't show up to meetings. Jesus doesn't actually come to church anymore. Jesus doesn't actually tell people. Jesus has a representative to do that. And who is that? It's me, the Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, invested by Jesus. That's kind of a thumbnail sketch of the idea of papal power. One other thing about Leo. He confirmed all of the decisions of the Council of Chalcedon, which met in 451, with one notable exception. Canon 28 of the Chalcedonian definitions said that the city of Constantinople should be regarded as equal in dignity to Rome. And Leo said, not on your life. There was only one Peter, one Bishop of Rome, and I'm afraid that Constantinople gets the silver medal at best. It certainly will not be regarded as equal to Rome. Well, beyond this, Leo was a forceful opponent of heresy, especially of the Manichaean, the Pelagian, the Nestorian, and the Priscillian heresies, some of which we've talked about in previous sessions. And it's his life and his work which lay the foundations for the later claims of papal sovereignty. The title Vicar of Christ appears 
widely in the fifth century, and it will be the seventh century when the term the Vicar of God, the representative of God, comes into widespread use and becomes really affiliated and applied to the bishop in Rome. Now I want to say just a couple of things about one other pope before we turn to the Middle Ages. And it's the Bishop of Rome, Galatius I, who died in the year 496. Now I mention this largely unknown man because as Bishop of Rome, he introduced an idea that would have profound reverberations for an understanding of the Middle Ages. It was called the theory of the two powers. The two powers, according to Bishop Galatius, one was the consecrated authority of the bishops. And what he meant by that was the popes, the Bishop of Rome. And the other he nominated as royal power. And this was equated with the emperors. So you've got church and state, emperors and popes. Now, Galatius said both powers are trusts from God sovereign and independent in their own sphere, but spiritual power was more important. It was superior to secular power because the secular authorities owed the spiritual powers their salvation. So you've got equals, but first among equals. Now the arrangement, as you might expect, was potentially explosive, particularly if you're an emperor. When the two powers cooperated, and that was the ideal, then things went well. But what guarantees were there? The conflict would not dominate the relationship between the most powerful offices in the world. Popes like to claim that they were head of the whole world, as Adrian I did around 790. And this certainly did not endear popes to sitting emperors who took exception to that. And sometimes the two were in cahoots, and they would crown each other. Popes would say to the emperor, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I'll look out for your interests, you look out for mine. I won't step on your toes, don't step on mine. And they'd have this little arrangement uh, that could be mutually satisfying. And it's of note that it's Galatius I in the year 495 who is first referred to as the vicar of Christ. We turn to Gregory I. He's called the father of the medieval papacy, uh, a very important personality. He was elected pope in the year 590, and he took the term servants, servant of the servants of God. That's how he referred to himself, servant of the servants of God. It's one of the papal titles to this day. He served as bishop of Rome from 590 to 604. Prior to this, Gregory had enjoyed a pretty successful public career. Then he became a monk. He founded a monastery in Rome, and he used family land on the island of Sicily, off the south coast of Italy, to establish and endow a further six religious houses. He was unanimously chosen Bishop of Rome in the year 590, but he initially resisted this. He went so far as to write to the emperor, asking him not to confirm the appointment. But of course, Gregory later relented and became Pope Gregory I. It's noteworthy that he was the first monk to be chosen as bishop of Rome, the first monk. And when he becomes bishop of Rome, or pope, if you will, he tried to fill many of the papal offices with other monks. You see, he was really uh, in favor of the monastic life. And this enraged the secular clergy, who felt like they were being marginalized in deference to monks. He possessed excellent administrative skills, and he is known to history as Gregory the Great. And of course, one has to do something notable to go down in history as the Great. But he is Gregory the Great. More recently, his significance in terms of music and liturgy has come under sustained uh, scrutiny by scholars. And I think the bottom line is that his contribution to these sorts of things was pretty slight, though the term Gregorian chants 
continues and persists to the present. Now the medieval papacy, as it's beginning to develop, and I have given but a thumbnail sketch, really gets a boost, really gets a real shot in the arm from what I cannot call other than some expedient forgeries. How do you solidify power? Well, it was forged. To go straight to the point, there were forgeries that propped up some of these extravagant claims to papal power. I want to mention but two of them to you. The first is known as the Donation of Constantine. The Donation of Constantine is a purported document from the fourth century linked allegedly to Emperor Constantine who died in the year 337. So it has to be before that. It gives significant power to the bishop in Rome. It confirms, this document does, papal primacy over the Eastern patriarchs. You see this, this uh, division, this head-to-head, -head, Rome and Constantinople, East and West, Latin and Greek. The donation says, in this dispute, it is the Bishop of Rome that takes first place. Well, that's such an important document to have if you're the Bishop of Rome. Whenever there's an argument, you just pull out your pocket copy of the donation and say, aha, the emperor has granted me the right to have power. It did more than that. The, do the donation of Constantine gave to the pope power over the city of Rome and all of the places cities and provinces of Italy and the West. All at once, the popes do not just have spiritual power and authority, they have social and political power as well. Now while this is a crucial document uh, for the history of the papacy, and while there are many appeals made to it, I have to tell you that by the end of the Middle Ages there were severe problems with the claim that it dated to the fourth century. Now recall I began by saying it was an expedient forgery. On what basis would I say such a thing? Well first of all if we examine the language of the document we find that the language does not match the language of the Constantinian era at all. It would be rather like, shall I say, a document being discovered purporting to be dated to the year 1602, but it's written in late 20th century American English. Just not going to fly, is it? I mean, who in 1602 would be using American colloquialisms? Not possible. So this is what you have in the donation. The language is not fourth century. Secondly, would you believe that in this document there are references to controversies which only became controversies in the 8th century. Uh-oh, uh, maybe the author of the donation was a prophet. Otherwise, um, he or she knew what was going to be happening 400 years hence and wrote it in. You're starting to follow the argument here. Thirdly, there's not a single document at the time of Constantine that refers to it. Now come on, a document this sweeping, this powerful in its uh, implications and nobody else has mentioned it? And how about one more point? No pope, no bishop of Rome ever referred to it or ever exercised the power latent within it until the 8th century. Well, I'm prepared to go on record then as saying it is necessary to conclude that this document is a forgery compiled likely in stages in the second half of the ninth century. It's got nothing to do with Constantine. He never even dreamed of it, let alone wrote it. Well, that's one expedient forgery, but nobody questioned it until the time of the Italian Renaissance in the mid-15th century. I have another expedient forgery to tell you about. This one has the more interesting name of the Pseudo-Isidorian Decretals. It's a collection of ecclesiastical laws, church rules, if you will. About one-third of these so-called laws are pure invention. I mean, they just didn't exist uh, before the 8th century. The rest of it is either garbled or it's genuine. Now, the substance of the collection isn't invention. What's invention? 
is that it's passed off as law. You're all aware of the fact that it's one thing to have a document. It's another thing that that document is legally binding. Okay, so here's what we have with the pseudo Isidorian decretals. The collection is falsely ascribed to Isidore of Seville, who was a well-known 7th century personality. The objective of this collection is to attack lay and royal, royal jurisdiction, to attack the emperors and secular power, and to give, by contrast, more power to the popes. Remember, I've called it an expedient forgery. The forgers pretended that these materials were ancient. You know how some of us, we, we're just so impressed with things that are old. But we've been doing this for 200 years. This painting that I have uh, is actually 300 years old. Who cares? It doesn't mean that it's necessarily valuable, right? But the forgers in the 8th century tried to pass it off as an ancient document and insisted it had descended through the popes, giving it even more power and authority. In actuality, it can pretty well be put down to having been written or assembled in the mid-9th century, probably at Reims. And the forgers used every opportunity at their disposal to advance the papacy as the mother of all churches, the Roman church, and having overarching legal authority. And of course, as we might guess, this collection actually had within it the donation of Constantine. Well, Pseudo Isidore had the advantage of containing almost every relevant papal decree or council decision in a single reference book. How convenient. We don't have to go looking for documents to undergird the power of popes. We've got it all right here in one book. How convenient. I'm prepared also to say that this is one of the most influential fabrications in the history of all medieval Europe. It's about 750 closely printed pages, and it's a gold mine if you're the pope. Well, having said this now, let me just shift gears to tell you that by the time the papacy was well established, had all of the authority you could possibly want and the books and documents to back it up, the papacy in the 9th and the 10th century plunged into an abyss, into a time. It's a story largely of disaster, and it is referred to as the dark century because well, let me just introduce you to a few popes that you've never heard of and just tell you in brief what was going on. John the Twelfth was sometimes called a dissolute boy. He was all of 18 years of age when he was appointed pope, and he died of sexual excess, if we are to believe the report by the Bishop of Cremona, sexual excess. He suffered a stroke while enjoying the company in bed of a married woman. My, my, my. John VIII was murdered by members of his own entourage who poisoned him. And then the poison was rather slow acting, so they dragged him outside and beat him over the head with a few clubs, and he died. He is the first pope to be murdered at the hands of assassins, to have died at the hands of assassins. Adrian III died suddenly. Foul play was suspected. Stephen VI was strangled to death while in prison. Benedict IV was rumored to have been murdered. That was never proven. But this was an age of corruption and an age of intrigue. And some wanted to put the papacy as an institution completely into hell. Ah, but there's more. Benedict VI was smothered. Leo V was murdered by having his neck wrung pretty tightly. John X took a nap in the year 929 and somebody slipped into the papal bedroom and held a pillow over his face for some time. Stephen VIII was given such a severe beating by a gang of thugs that he later died from the beating. John XIV was done to death under mysterious circumstances while residing in the Castel San Angelo, which was effectively a prison on the banks of the Tiber in Rome, 
possibly starved to death or poisoned. We can't be too sure, but nonetheless, he came out of the prison feet first. Boniface the seventh died naturally all right, but once dead, his body was pulled into the streets of Rome, stripped, hauled down in front of the Lateran church naked where people stomped on it and stabbed the cadaver with swords and spears. Well, what a dark century. The papacy has gone from this height of world domination to crime and murder and intrigue. And there were papal scandals. Let me tell you two of them. One is about Pope Formosus and the Cadaver Council. He had many relentless enemies. When he died in the year 897, his decaying corpse was exhumed from the cemetery and brought into a court where they dressed poor old, old ex-pope Formosus up in his papal gowns, put the crown on his head and put him on trial. His successor did. A solemn mock trial was held, presided over by his successor, Stephen the Sixth, while a deacon was compelled to answer charges on behalf of the mute, dead, ex-pope Formosus. At the end of the day, he was found guilty on all charges, and every decision that he'd, be, he'd made as pope was declared null and void. And to make that point pointed, they held up his hands and they cut off his fingers one after the other to show that the hand that had signed the decrees was invalid. Once finished with him, they dragged him outside and tossed his body into the Tiber River. A few days later, the man who presided over that trial, Stephen VI, was strangled to death. Now, it would seem that being pope in these days was, shall we say, a rather perilous occupation. But there's another scandal you need to know about, and it's the strange case of Pope Joan. This is a tradition that is told even to this day that once upon a time there was a woman by the name of Joan who was made pope in the 9th or was it the 10th? Uh, perhaps it was the 11th century. Nobody really seems to know when. She was a talented woman disguised as a man who worked her way up through the church hierarchy to the day when she was made pope. Well, she was only discovered to be a man when she inconveniently gave birth during a public procession. Now there's variants on the tale. One is that she gave birth as she tried to mount a horse during that procession in Rome. She was tied to the horse's tail and dragged through the streets of Rome and then stoned to death. Or the other story is she actually died right there on the street giving birth. Uh, visual images portray her as being hanged with her child as well. But it would be wrong to continue this tale too much further because while there was scandal and corruption and sin and intrigue, there were efforts to reform the papacy. The foremost of the reforming popes was Leo IX, who reigned between 1049 and 1054. He constructed a papal monarchy. He brought to Rome church leaders from outside the Roman orbit. You see, you have too many people on the inside, it becomes inbred. Nepotism rules. He brought in outsiders, new ideas, new blood. This infused new life into the papacy. This new blood that came into the papal curia, if you will, also had new ideas of papal power. And similarly, they had notions that the popes should be a moral force. Uh, they certainly had been much of a moral force prior to this with all of these crimes and scandals and goings on which I have mentioned only briefly. Well, Leo was determined not to get bogged down in the bureaucracy of being Bishop of Rome and he spent very little time in Rome. In fact, he spent an enormous amount of time away from Rome presiding over councils issuing decrees on matters like simony, clerical marriage, and moral laxity. And thanks to him, the papacy began to recover 
from this period of shame and scandal that it had been bogged down in. There's two developments, which I mention only in passing, because they'll be taken up in subsequent lectures, but two developments out of the effort to reform the papal authority and the papal office. One was the development of canon law, church law, and the other was at relationships with Constantinople. With the Eastern, the Greek church began to worsen. But perhaps the best known pope of this period is a man who had the name Gregory VII, great 11th century pope. He set out to make reforms, particularly in the areas of simony and concubinage. Concubinage, of course, being the notion of priests having girlfriends. Now, they weren't supposed to be married. They were supposed to be chaste. But alas, many of them were not. And he said, I'm going to fix this. We're going to clamp down on it. Well, in terms of simony, uh, in Dante, for example, popes who practiced simony, that is the buying of ecclesiastical power, are found in hell, head down in the flames. And you can see pictures in Dante. But then there was this great confrontation in northern Italy in the winter of 1077. At the castle near the town of Canossa, Gregory is there spending the winter in this castle. The German Emperor Henry IV, after a running battle with the Pope, feels obliged to make the trip during the winter across the Alps from Germany down into northern Italy, coldest winter on record. He arrives at the papal residence and knocks on the door. The Pope makes him wait all day and all night. Day two, he knocks on the door, says, I want to come in and talk to the Pope. He stands for three days, bare feet, bare head, in the northern Italian winter snow, waiting for Gregory to let him in. You talk about a power play? You talk about letting who know that you're in charge? Gregory sat in there with his feet in front of the warm, roaring fire, sipping warm tea, as Henry shivered in the snow, waiting to do penance. And finally, the Holy Father was obliged to let the penitent in. But you talk about a victory of the papacy over the emperor. You have it right here. Well, this didn't go over well with a lot of people. Henry IV's sympathetic Italian and German bishops called upon Gregory to stand down, to resign, to back off. They wrote him a letter addressed to Hildebrand. That was his real name. Dear Hildebrand, no longer pope, but false monk, the letter began. Well, we have again the makings of conflict at the highest levels in Europe. But Gregory marks a turning point in the history of the papal office. The popes had now gained significant power. This was a high point in the development of their claims when you can get an emperor to stand barefoot in the snow for three days. That's power. Popes now, after the time of Gregory, were really committed to a power struggle with secular rulers. And there had to be ways of dealing with them. Gregory VII published his Dictates of the Pope. It's a document that can be found in the register of Pope Gregory, and it claimed for the Pope almost unbelievable power, prestige, and holiness in the church. It consisted of a list of 27 statements, which amounted to a comprehensive outline of the doctrine of papal primacy. It had considerable significance for canon law, which was yet to come. It had significance for papal claims, and I would argue for the history of the church in general. And you're wondering what in the world were in these dictates of the pope. Well, before I tell you, I want to make another thing clear. The writing is in the hand of Gregory. So it wasn't like having a secretary or a recording person in a meeting who's taking the minutes. It's what he or she hears that's written down. The handwriting is Gregory's. He wrote down exactly what he meant, and he meant what he wrote. Some of the statements are extraordinary. I'll not read all 27, but here's a sampling. 
the Pope cannot be judged by anyone. Well, that, that's good to have if you're the Pope. The Roman Church has never erred and will never err. And that's also good to know that you're part of an infallible institution. The Pope can depose anybody he wants. Also very good. Only the Pope can make new laws. You can see the implications of the tenor of these dictates of Gregory VII. The Pope can depose emperors. Since when? Well, Gregory says, I can do it. I made Henry stand in the snow, and I'll make you bow the knee too. And all princes ought to kiss the Pope's feet. I mean, to actually say that, to kiss the Pope's feet. Now these statements and the other 21 underscore complete conviction in papal sovereignty on the part of Gregory and his successors in the affairs of Christendom right across the board. There's one other development to mention during Gregory's long and successful pontificate, and it's the so-called investiture contest. Now this was a long series of disputes between popes and emperors over who has the right to confer upon bishops and abbots, abbots the head of monasteries, their symbols of office. Who's got that power? Popes or emperors? So investiture contest. Well, in October of 1075, a Roman synod published a famous decision which forbade lay investiture. Quoting in brief, if anyone in future receives a bishopric or abbey from the hands of any lay person, such a one is under no circumstance to be ranked among the bishops and we exclude that person from the grace of St. Peter. And if any emperor, king, or prince, or any lay power, any secular power at all, presumes to invest anybody with a bishopric or any church office, let that individual know that they will henceforth incur the sentence of excommunication, a serious penalty. We'll talk about excommunication on another occasion. So in the end, the popes win. But lay rulers retain some power over the elections themselves. But now I have to tell you that Gregory overreached himself. It's always possible in the lust for power to go just a little bit too far. You get some and you want more. And you get that and then you reach a little further. And Gregory reached too far. His pontificate failed on account of his lack of tact, his refusal to compromise, and his harsh language. Thirteen of his own cardinals abandoned his program. Now this is serious because the cardinals had taken the view that they were the hinges of the church. Nothing turned without them. Popes shouldn't act without us. He alienated his cardinals, and this was the beginning of his downfall. Hardly any secular ruler was on good terms with Gregory. So far had he reached and how badly he alienated them. And before his death, he was losing ground everywhere. And his old nemes, nemesis, Henry IV, was gaining everywhere. Canossa was forgotten. The triumph there was forgotten. Now as we move forward just a little bit further in a survey of the medieval papacy, we come to the 12th century. The 12th century begins with a great deal of conflict and division between the cardinals and a schism. A church split seems imminent. And this actually happened in 1130 with the election of rival popes, Innocent II and Anacletus II. Two of them vying for the highest office in the land, as it were. Bernard of Clairvaux, whom we'll hear more about on another occasion, intervened. And Bernard chose Innocent would be the man, and he had such clout that Innocent II did in fact become Pope. But before this, there were even other developments. A council was held in the Lateran, in a church in Rome, in the year 1123, 
which was actually the first ecumenical council to be held in all of Christendom since 869. A period of 250 years had passed. And it was the first council to be held in the West under the jurisdiction of the Pope. Moreover, it was the first council to publish decisions in the name of and under the authority of a Pope. Well, for this to happen, it was a clear signal that papal success continued. Despite the ups and the downs, the popes were still on top of the world. And from this time on, the bishops of Rome, the popes, took on special legal prerogatives and interventionary powers, especially concerning the appointment of priests to churches and benefices and overall authority. The development of canon law mid-12th century solidified these rights. Canon law is still an operative principle in the Catholic communion to this day. It has its roots right back in some of these events that I'm speaking of. The Pope was established in canon law and now it's real law, not fabricated. It's real law is established as the all-powerful head of the Christian communion and canon law takes precedent over every other form of law in the Middle Ages. And Gratian, the man who's putting this together in the mid-12th century, is laying the foundations for even wider and deeper and greater expressions of papal authority. Papal administration then began to grow exponentially because with responsibility comes all of this work, all of this bureaucracy. By the late 12th century, the canon lawyers were reflecting a new law code that was papal in origin, that was papal in spirit, that was designed to facilitate papal interests. We might ask, why were there no saints among 12th century popes? Some of the popes became saints. Why none from the 12th century? Well, could it be that they were so occupied with law and with papal authority and with bureaucracy that they didn't really have any time left to deal with holy and saintly things. One pope, in fact, was asked at this time, why are you wasting your time? Why do you sit from morning to evening listening to litigants when you're supposed to be the servant of the servants of God? It's instructive to note that every notable pope between 1159 and 1303 was a lawyer. 150 years of church history and every notable pope is a lawyer. Well, there were, as you might expect, continued and protracted struggles between popes and emperors during these times. And one of the more significant was be between the Roman emperor, sorry, the German emperor Frederick Barbarossa and Pope Alexander III. Corruption abounded. Attempts at reform were dead letters. Financial matters worsened. And before the 12th century had expired, once again, the papacy is in dire straits. But this time, it was Innocent III who was elected in 1198. And he made it his first task in office to get rid of the network of forgers operating in the papal chancery. Simony, nepotism, and greed abounded once again. And Innocent was determined to clean it up. The Third Lateran Council convened just before that in 1179. And it established some very important rules to govern papal church affairs. There were decrees against simony, decrees against individuals occupying several church appointments, drawing 16 salaries but actually only doing one job. There were sanctions against heretics that were also set down by the Third Lateran Council. And after this council, there were numerous popes presiding over the See of St. Peter. Many of these were short-lived. And those who did remain for a time, like Clement III, continued, alas, 
despite the efforts to be addicted to money and corruption and bribery, just continued and achieved new depths. And when he died, Clement III, things were so miserable, nobody wanted to be pope. It came up for a pope papal election, nobody wanted the job. Schism again loomed. At last, the oldest cardinal named Hyacinth was persuaded to accept the tiara, the papal crown. He took the name Celestine III. He was 85 years old. When he becomes pope, he'd been a cardinal for 47 years. But he was learned, he was fair, he appeared to be incorruptible, he was good, uh, he was opposed to materialism, and years earlier he'd actually defended Peter Abelard, a controversial 12th century theologian. And perhaps it was the character of Celestine that helped to bring some respect back to the chaotic papal office. And in the midst of this turbulent sea, up and down, back and forth, conflict and struggle, something should be said about the development of the papal state. Emperor Henry VI inconveniently died in 1197, and the popes, once again, with both hands in the pie, eagerly went after the prize, went after the political and economic values that were associated with that particular emperor. And agents of papal government and political machinery began to increase. There were many councils, most of them held at the Lateran in Rome. All of these were presided over by popes. Uh, decrees were issued under papal authority. And one way we can judge the bureaucratic increase of the church at this time is to look at papal letters. And I'll just give you a few statistics. In the 11th century, 1033 to 1046, Benedict IX averaged one papal letter a year. We move along uh, 100 years, the popes are averaging 72 papal letters per year. We move along another 100 years, and we're up to 730 letters per year. And we come up to John the 22nd at the early 14th century, and the popes are averaging over 3,600 papal letters per year. You go from one to 3,600. It is indicative of the bureaucratic machinery that's being put in place and the political machinations of the church. Now just a comment before papal elections, before we go to a conclusion. When a pope was crowned, a pope is elected by a conclave. That's the cardinals who go into a closed meeting. When the pope is elected, they put a, a scarlet robe on him. Uh, then he is led to the altar of, in this case, the Lateran Church. It's the Vatican today, but it was the Lateran then. Homage is received from the cardinals who bow and kiss his feet. And then the pope sits on a special chair for a while and looks out over his kingdom. And then he arises up. He receives the symbols of office, the keys, the papal crown, and he says the first mass. Now I want to conclude this particular lecture on popes by saying something about the peak of papal power, which comes between Innocent III and Boniface VIII. Innocent III symbolizes the height of papal power. It's fair to state that Innocent came closest of all the popes to the vision of papal theocracy, ruled by God through the pope, that had been promoted by people like Gregory VII previously. He's one of the great popes and even statesmen of the Middle Ages, called himself the vicar of Christ, claimed authority over secular rulers, took on the Cathar heretics in southern France, by means of a crusade. He convened the Fourth Council at the Lateran in 1215, where the doctrine of transubstantiation was promulgated for the first time in the history of the church. He put down heresy forcibly. He articulated the role of the church in secular justice, and he stressed the necessity of tithes. Of course, we must keep the papal machinery moving right along. 
He was succeeded by Innocent IV a little bit later, who did just about everything in reverse. It has been said, uh, apart from one of the things he did that I should mention, was to establish and legalize the use of judicial torture, which would play a key role in the workings of the Inquisition a little bit later. The opinion about Innocent IV is that he took the church at her best and in 11 years destroyed half of her and propelled her on a steep downward journey. That brings me to the last man I want to mention, Boniface VIII. Boniface VIII published a controversial document in the year 1302 and he concluded this way. We declare, state, define, and pronounce that it is altogether necessary to salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. This was an extraordinarily extreme and almost shocking statement for a pope to make. You must be in subjection to me. Otherwise, you can't be saved. Now, this marks the absolute apex of papal claim to power and authority. But the reaction against Boniface was so great that it also signaled a decline from which it might be argued the papacy has never recovered. The Christian church had come a long way from the catacombs when they used to meet in secret to the point now where a single Christian could say, I am the door of salvation. As we will see on another occasion, Boniface VIII was important in two ways, the height and the depth. And he came to a bad personal end, and the papacy, again, was cast into a turbulent sea. But now the story of the popes remains one of the most important topics in the study of the history of the Christian church. And the papacy clearly, whether one likes it or not, was one of the two pillars upon which the medieval church rested and on which the European Middle Ages found its moorings. For Jesus had said to his disciple Cephas, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. <laughs>